I'm S.A. Bradley, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror, where I remind you that you used to love horror movies, and you secretly still do. Hi, everybody. Happy Halloween from Hellbent for Horror. It is Halloween 2020. Oh, my God. Will we survive to see the dawn? We shall see. It's wonderful to go down the uh, the crazy path that we've been in 2020 with fine folks like yourselves, and thank you so much for being here. We are on the second half of our double feature, our Halloween double feature, two shows that have dropped. So our second show is two more folk from uh, the wonderful Cinema Wasteland convention. Uh, I'm I'm really missing the people from there and I miss some of the really great conversationalists and two of those folk are Mike Watt and Amy Lynn Best. They're a couple that have been making movies for about 20 years, independent films. We'll talk quite a bit about some of their films but also other things that really interest and excite them. What's been happening in the world, uh, how they're dealing with uh, all of the craziness that's happening here. Also the magazines that they work on which would be Grindhouse Purgatory and Exploitation Nation, two really good magazines. And uh, we spend some time just really enjoying each other's company of course i hope you enjoy being a fly on the wall on this but i was really excited to be able to talk with them i'm really excited to be able to share this with you and i'm really really glad that uh, you've hung out uh, to spend some time on this double feature with me until we meet again on the other side of this stay hell bent Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Hellbent for Horror. It's been a crazy October, as I'm sure you've all felt. It is not like normal Octobers, if there's ever really a normal October around here. Uh, But uh, what I'm really feeling is a couple days ago, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I guess, we would have been at Cinema Wasteland again. And uh, anybody who's listened to the show knows that uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Cinema Wasteland as a convention. And so, uh, of course, missing all the people that are there and uh, missing uh, the fun conversations. I mean, really, the, the biggest part of going to any con is getting to meet your folk and uh, spending time talking to them and just going down rabbit holes. And you've seen me do some live shows like this of recent, and I wanted to see about grabbing uh, two of my favorite people from Cinema Wasteland, uh, the writer-director duo from Happy Cloud Media, Mike uh, Mike Watt and Amy Lynn Best. And uh, they've been uh, stalwarts. Have you been at Cinema Wasteland since the beginning? Uh, Because you started in 1997, right? Ken started, was that when Ken started? We 2001 was his yeah. first show. We weren't there from the very beginning. We were there from year like three. Three. I, yeah. And then we never missed one. After yeah. That. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. So, uh, of course, I just mentioned Happy Cloud Media, and you're 20 years now, right? A little over. We're just going to keep saying it's 20 years until the you know, world, until the world <laughs> accepts us again. <laughs> we want to celebrate the anniversary, but there's nowhere to really celebrate and get yeah. a bunch of people together. So we're going to kind of hold that. So, um, yeah, Happy Cloud Media formed about three years ago, but we've been Happy Cloud Pictures for about 20 years yeah. now. Mm-hmm. Officially yeah. since 97. So, yeah. Uh, right. Working on yeah. your first film, Resurrection Game, right? Yes, sir. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. sir. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so anyway, we've never said yes, sir, when we're sitting around at the Cinema yeah. Wasteland, so we're, we're going to have to loosen this up a little bit. Yeah, One of the uh, things... Drinking that Guinness. <laughs> I don't know I if I've ever... <laughs> I don't know if I ever asked you folks the the question I I normally ask people on the show, and I'm really interested. Uh, First kiss. What for each of you was the first kiss, the horror movie that you saw, the exploitation film that you saw that just drew you were going to be in love for life? I thought you were talking about ours, first of all, and I was trying to remember. So, you know, that was funny. Anyway. Okay. That's why I actually have the double entendre of the... (laughs) Go ahead. ahead. Okay. Um, I don't know if this, my first conscious memory of being scared and enjoying it was back in the, in the stone age when we only had a couple of TV channels, Mm -hmm. we had two UHS channels um, and a, and a PBS PBS was showing the skeleton dance, the the Walt Disney thing (laughs) from the forties freaked me out. So I quickly hit the switch, got to a UHF channel that was showing the Virgin of Nuremberg uncut with Christopher Lee. And I landed of course on the, cage over the face, the rat eating the nose scene. So I'm switching back and forth, basically screaming my head off between the skeleton dance and the 
missing rat. That's why I figured, I think I'm just going to do this. So I'm just going to lean into being terrified of it and really started to enjoy it. And I became a morbid kid after that. Yours? I, yeah. I just remember always being surrounded. My mom liked a lot of the Universal movies. Um, Abbott and Costello was, was big with her. Mm-hmm. And then I remember going to see... I don't remember seeing Last House on the Left. I remember seeing the double feature, which was Amityville Horror with my uncle when I was nine. He took me and two of my cousins to see that. Um, Last House on the Left, and that little nine-year-old and a 10-year-old and a 13-year-old, he took his three little nieces. So he he is mortified still to this day. We were talking about that a couple of years ago. Um, <laughs> But I remember Amityville Horror. I think he sent us out of the theater a lot, is what he said <laughs> during Last House. So I don't remember a lot about that movie. But Amityville Horror just freaked me out, especially since my cousins told me it was a true story. And my grandmother had a room like the room in the basement. So, of course, mm-hmm. you know, the next day we were all going to get shoved into that room and go to hell. So, And it was just great. Just so freaky and weird. Um, and I just, yeah kept gravitating towards weird, freaky movies that scared me and my cousins. And it was a lot of fun from then on. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's funny. Because I remember Amityville Horror. What scared me was Jody the Pig, the concept of Jody the Pig. This weird pig that had glowing red eyes and everything. And I remember freaking myself out in in high school, out out in the woods, drinking beers with friends. And I'm going, you know what really scares me about Jody the pig? I don't know if you guys remember in the Bible, but Jesus comes across a possessed man and uh, they ask about the demon and he says, I am legion. And he throws all the demons, you know, there's like a thousand demons or something into this herd of pigs. I'm like, and they drown. And maybe this one didn't drown. And as soon as I said that, the beer kicked in, whatever else is happening. I'm like, oh God, Jody the pig. That's why that's so fucking scary. But uh, I love the, those kind of stories about like your uh, the corruptors, right? I love <laughs> finding out who's who are the corruptors in the family. And your poor uncle, last house on the left, is like piss yourself, popcorn, everybody, popcorn, yeah. <laughs> popcorn, go 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 get something else. Two dollar uh, tickets, four hundred dollars in concession. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, what do you feel really draws you into? Uh, genre, because I, I want to say genre, I'm a big horror f- folk, and I know that you guys are as well, but I know that also Exploitation Nation, uh, the, the the magazine that you publish, as well as Grindhouse uh, Purgatory, go into further depth than just those things. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's mostly we're a fan of movies. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's definitely, this is Bo, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> now he's over here. <laughs> yeah. Um, we love movies. We love all sorts of different movies. It doesn't matter the genre, if it's a good movie or an engaging movie or a captivating movie or a well done movie. We, we love movies. The genre stuff, it's fun. The, the horror is definitely fun. And the fandom that surrounds it is one of my favorite things. It's, it's weird to like horror movies that we've all been told our entire lives growing up. It's weird that we like these movies not on Halloween. So finding a whole group of people that like these movies not on Halloween is honestly my favorite part of the whole genre. Um, so, yeah, that's, that, that's a short answer for me. I, I, I think horror, horror lets you backdoor in just about anything. Um, mm-hmm. You go to, if you go to very specific science fiction shows, uh, very spe- like Star Trek shows, anime shows, they feel a little more closed off where horror fans tend to have just, um, um, I don't want to say they're more welcoming, but yeah, I do. I want to say they're more welcoming because I feel like um, it's a little more universal. You can tell just about any yes. story in, if, in a horror, in a horror in comedy, tragedy, uh, Oedipal. Uh, the the resurrection, the redemption, anything can be told through a horror uh, lens through it. And I feel that that's what makes everything a little more universal. And that's, as Amy said, we're, we're usually movie fans first, but we like, everyone likes the subversive stuff. Everyone loves to be the guy that introduces their friend to the fucked up movie. You know, uh, our, our, our late friend, Andy Kopp would, would say, you have to see this. And every time the, my stomach would drop, Every time I make a recommendation, because I knew it was going to be horrifying. And uh, he would say things like, well, you, did you see the story between the frames? Like, no, t- I was too busy wondering why I'm still friends with you. you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, edit, again, he has his, his sort of anytime he recommends something, I know that it's going to be a two beer afternoon. You know, <laughs> so. 
Well, it's funny that you mentioned uh, the uh, how horror just is so universal because that's something that I preach a lot, which is uh, you can either look at it as horror as like the uh, Frank's hot, red hot sauce. It goes with everything. You can just basically put a few dashes and, and add it. But it also uh, allows uh, metaphor and allegory for anything that you want to talk about. And in these really uh, crazy times, uh, there's so much that you can talk about without uh, causing people to, like throw chairs if you uh, start in a horror milieu, or at least it used to be that way. I'm not necessarily sure we can do that anymore. But um, how are you guys? Uh, so you're in Pittsburgh, correct? We're yes, about 20 miles south of Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, um, how are you guys dealing with like the cognitive dissonance of what's been going on for the last year or so? Because it's right. been it's been really bizarre. I know Pittsburgh's been having issues first off with the independent film community kind of getting uh, some old buildings or old uh, uh, festivals and groups have kind of disappeared. And now you've got this happening. Uh, how how do you feel like you're really stuck in a pod, or how's it been going? You, well, say, you you interact with people. I don't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we've been kind of isolated. We moved away from Pittsburgh about it was 2001, 2002. We moved down to Waynesburg, which is about 60 miles south of Pittsburgh. So we kind of isolated ourselves at that point, and that's where we made most of our features. We we kind of took it away from Pittsburgh, did a lot of stuff still with Pittsburgh people and still kind of in the Pittsburgh area. Some locations were in Pittsburgh, but I, I, we always kind of lived in our own pod, yeah. if that makes sense. It, since we started, we li- we, we'd we reach out to other people, but it was pretty much our own pod of people. Yeah. So if we'd been able to get together, it probably wouldn't affected us much, but you know, since you can't get together, it kind of does. Um, and as far as the whole, Pittsburgh area. I have I've heard there are a couple of big productions like Netflix productions that are getting ready to start up. Um, from what I understand, they're all going to be safe quarantine type set. So, which is good. I'm glad they're able to start doing that. But yeah, I, I'm. I it, it's been really weird because again, like I said, we kind of isolated ourselves, especially the last three years. Last three years, personally, we're like pretty hard on us. Um, yeah. Lots of family issues happening. So I can't tell you what happened after 2017, except <coughs> at Wasteland pretty much in horror or anything else. I just didn't pay attention too much. Um, so we were just starting to kind of get out of that feeling and wanting to get back into the world and starting to book shows. And we had had a couple of productions planned and I was going to do another, uh, I was doing summer classes for girls in horror at the different Uh, schools around here of course those are gone now all those classes so it it has affected us but then it hasn't if that makes I I know I kind of rambled and went in a big circle there but yeah it's it's weird the world's freaking weird it's like okay let's go oh wait you can't do that um (laughs) how about we oh wait we can't do that okay how about yeah shoot I don't know I don't know what to do yeah that that's the weirdness of the cognitive dissonance uh I, I did a show about this when it first started, uh, just about uh, the decade, the past decade on horror and what I saw as some trends and almost felt like we were somewhat predictive of it because there was a lot of things about uh, the end of world and isolation. Uh, But it's also kind of like we're been Greco Roman wrestling with the world. And it just landed on top of us and said, yeah, you're not moving. And we're like, okay, we're humbled now. I'm good. No, no, you're not. I'll let you know when you're done. And so it went from being like, there's, I understand this is a moral, right? Uh, to us now feeling like, wow, this is really bizarre and things have changed completely. Uh, I think it's weird because we have this strange cognitive dissonance of uh, it's the apocalypse, but I can get takeout and they're <laughs> Amazon trucks, right? And so it delivers my groceries. I'm good. Yeah. I, yeah. I think fans are more equipped to deal with the pandemic. Actually, I can say, oh, yeah. especially Icelanders, Gen because of a number of reasons, Gen Xers were used to being ignored and in our own high pod anyway. That's our entire generation is being ignored. So please, and we're good with that. We're also <laughs> antisocial for most for the most of us as well. Um, and for Wastelanders, we only like other Wastelanders. Right. So we're, we're hanging out with other Wastelanders and fine, I'll just be in my house by myself. Um, if, if it wasn't for like needing an income, I'd be living my best life right now. 
and and we own medium. We own the media, so yes, I can yes, sit yes. and watch anything that I want at any time. I'm in the bunker, splendid oh, isolation. My. Yeah, that that's the weird thing. Is I mean, I don't know about you, but most of the people I know around our age and the people even young, we've been preparing for this, mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. watching these movies for oh, years. That we've been joking, kind of joking about the zombie <clears throat> apocalypse. How many oh, years yeah. have you been? Jo- Ninety seven was the first time I remember, and I remember our our old business partner we lived with a couple of different homes and we would go into the homes we would go into an apartment and actually look around and he would make us tell he would make us tell him how we would zombie proof each room yeah this is back in like 97 yeah and our attitude was what if he's right yeah so, okay i'll keep a jar of nails next to the windows i don't give a shit but if he's if he's right then i'm ahead <laughs> right if he's wrong it's a jar of nails <laughs> it's a jar of nails yes well this is like uh, that's what i told somebody i said the world is now kind of understanding what it's like to be in my head 24 7 so people are like man i feel a little disassociated from everybody it's like hey guess what i wake up i just don't have that on my face i'm just I'm walking yeah. around the klaxons are going off over here and uh, my wife's a microbiologist so we we've been watching for at least a decade like oh this is it this is it oh no we made it wow bird flu you know all that stuff we've been following these fucking things and going ah was it ever going to happen and and sure of course it's going to sooner or later and here we are in this thing where everything is a little bit different than it used to be uh i mean i don't know have you guys had to like do things like go to the vet or go to the dentist no dentist no no No. dentist we did um one of our dogs is uh diabetic so we wanted to make sure we got his six month checkup. We did his checkup early March because we were taking him to Horror Realm, which was the last show we did. <laughs> um, and we just wanted to, you know, just go in, check up, make sure everything's good before he went to horror and his nails because he hates his nails done. So I let the ladies at the clinic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but so we did go to the vet. We went in. It was after they stopped doing curbside come out and, and pick up. So we were in the store. Everybody was masked. Everybody was distanced. You gave the dog and my friend works there. So we just gave the dog to basically our pet sitter who works at the vet. So, um, they took them back, did everything. The doctor called us on the phone. I talked to him for a bit and then everything was fine. So they brought the dog back out and we left. <laughs> um, anything else? Uh, basically it's just been trips to the store and uh, I'm working at a part time at a little uh, at a country club, um, <laughs> little office. But other than that, yeah, we we really haven't done much of anything. We did do it to a drive-in. <laughs> yeah, I'm dying to go to a drive-in. I'm like, I'll eat yeah. my uh, my firstborn if I ever have one, uh, just to go to the drive-in at this point because it's just been insane. I did a drive-in kind of in my at my house for my neighbors. Right. I yeah. Put, so- yeah. Uh, and that was uh, as much as we've been able to do. But yeah, uh, going to the dentist was this weird, bizarre thing. Going to the doctor is this very strange. I got my my flu shot uh, in a drive through driving by and just put your arm out. I want to <laughs> moon them. Yeah. It's, you're just sitting there in the car. I was like, I should just give him my butt and say, I, I take all my shots here. Sorry. But um, the uh, it yeah. was so bizarre having like uh, the dentist – where you walk in and all the chairs are cordoned off like it's a crime scene. And there's one chair that you can go into and you're going to sit there. And as soon as you walk in the door, they're handing you the gel and you're putting it on your hands and swathing it down to your elbows. And then it's like, here, put this in your mouth. And it's like this sterilization. It's just so crazy. (laughs) It feels very Cronenbergian to do anything at this point. You're you're so aware of the body and you become aware, like they did a dental x-rays. I'm sitting there going, you're shooting invisible monsters at me while you're protecting me from invisible monsters with this mask. And we've just got all these fucking monsters in the air. I'm going to go crazy. What the fuck is happening here? So yeah. <laughs> You're not making me look forward to my next colonoscopy. I will tell you this. Oh, time. Lord. Yeah, well, I'm glad to know up until now you were. You were like going, no, yeah. where yeah, is it on the on calendar? calendar? I was getting them long before they were prescribed. Right. And they would say, this is a Wendy's. <laughs> You're right. That's a that's the trip to the florist just for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's. I, I don't know. Just going to the grocery store and having to remember to stand away from everybody. Having going. I never needed that reminder. Well, 
well, that's kind of what's nice about this whole thing is you don't have those people bumping into you and touching you like, you know, right. you're used to oh, that kind you. of stuff is kind of, yeah, people are not doing that anymore, which is nice because it made my skin crawl and it made everything kind of that much worse. So there are newer stuff now because now everybody's like walking around with their masks down here if yeah. they have them all over. But yeah, you don't have people touching you. So the personal space thing is, uh, is you know, marvelous. Yay. Yay for personal space. Yay, Corona. Uh, sorry, that was really bad. But you know, <laughs> I got to look at silver linings where I can get them. <laughs> oh, it makes sense. And I mean, so many of my friends are in the same kind of uh, personality trait, right? So uh, I'm hearing it all the time. I do have some friends. Like I used to think that I was an introvert until uh, uh, several months into this. And I'm like, well, perhaps... You know, I almost felt like calling the old time and temperature phone numbers that they had in Pennsylvania. <laughs> Hear a voice sit there and say, oh, temperature is 72. Again, this has been us for the last... At least last two months. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it was, yeah. There were a couple of things that hit us pretty hard. Um, so we kind of dug in anyway. So this just feels like a continuation. And then it's weird when other people are doing it too now. Yeah. Like, because... When this thing first started, um, I w- we were both home, and it didn't feel any different from last year at that time. It was after uh, it, my mom passed, and we had the funeral, and it was like, Sorry. and then we were both home for like three months, so it felt like that whole thing again. So it didn't feel like the world was going through it. It felt like we were still going through it, which was just really weird until we started going out a little bit more and realizing, Oh, it's not just us now. It's, it's everybody's in this boat, which it's really horrible to say. And I really feel guilty saying this, but sometimes I feel a little bit better that it's not just us anymore doing this. Of course. (laughs) course. Yeah. That makes all the sense in the world. I don't like specific problems. I don't like Scott Bradley problems. I like problems. Everybody's in. We're all in this together. And it's nice that, because when we we were going through everything, I just the thought of leaving my house was exhausting and it's awful. And like going to visit his sister that lives like seven miles away from us was just the biggest chore in the world, just getting out of the house to get there. Going to Wasteland was so far, but we knew once we got there, it was going to be great. But just, you know, going to visit people or meet people for a movie just seemed like this insurmountable uh, barrier. Yeah, it was, it was horrible going to visit my family. My, you know, going to visit anybody was just terrible. So we were putting a lot of people off and I felt guilty. Now that we have like an actual reason, <laughs> it almost is a little easier to deal with. And I think it's helping get over that feeling a little bit more because now I really want to see people because I can't. So, right, yeah. So that little bit of going out, I can do now. <laughs> That's really interesting because I mean, I think in some ways we don't really hone our empathy until we have uh, uh, some kind of experience that allows us to see in a little bit further. And I think for the general populace, uh, I think uh, a lack of empathy had been happening. And I think now there's a, I I won't say that there's a, a, a renaissance of empathy, but at the same point, I will say that it seems like people are a little bit more understanding uh, of things uh, that are happening with other people in certain spots. I mean, I'm also kind of bubbled in San Francisco, San Francisco Bay area. I mean, we we have maniacs here. There's no doubt. We have people who are uh, anti everything's, uh, but at the same point, uh, for the most part, we're still kind of on lockdown and taking it as seriously as possible. And yes, there are people walking around like that, this and ironically enough, the people who have their masks down like this are the people who are constantly saying, put your pants up to people who are yeah, wearing right. their pants down. Right. So it's just uh, absurd. But um, so you're talking about real life things that have happened that uh, kind of uh, can affect you deeply. And I've always found that things that happen with me, uh, movies, uh, one of the reasons that I love cinema is that movies are always this wonderful escape for me to, to be able to get away. And um, you guys went from being watchers to actual creators. You were compelled. What was the compulsion? What made you both decide we must do the resurrection game? Naivety or ego? Yes. Okay. Naivety <laughs> and ego. We we you you had you had an engineering and finance background. I had just graduated from film school. Uh, our partner Bill Homan had just graduated from ITT Technical Institute and could 
could MacGyver anything you wanted. So we sat there. Also, oh, I'm sorry, good. He'd also gone to uh, Art Institute Art for Institute. special effects. Sorry, so he studied under, it's important. <laughs> he studied under Jerry Gurgley uh, from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He was a, a, a mentor of his. So we all sat down and went, you know what? It's 1997. It's damn time we made a feature film. I, we had, you know, and that was all we had thought about. We we knew we could get equipment through uh, through the uh, Pittsburgh filmmakers, which I just graduated. I was working in a film lab, so I could uh, steal some of the equipment. It's gone now. You don't have to yell at me. They <laughs> they can't sue us anymore. Most of the footage we shot was stolen. <laughs> um, not sure. Anyway, <laughs> some of it. And, but the the attitude was it was really the little rascals. We're going to we're going to get all this stuff and we're going to go shoot a zombie movie and we did <laughs> on 16 millimeter film we shot and cut and edited and art editor always yells at me because we don't play that up uh and i always ask him well shooting on film never put another dollar in our pocket it's cool to say that we did but, <laughs> but yeah so that was that was that history we we're just going to throw everything into it every genre we can think of we're going to throw into this silly movie uh, and we pulled it off and it, it <laughs> you can see it to this day it's I'll a ton of fun that. i enjoy it yeah well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Mike had been making movies for years because Mike wanted to be a filmmaker since uh, the Star Wars. Pretty much. And that's why he went to film school. So it was, you know, kind of his wanting to do all that where Bill wanted to, he loved effects. He loved gore. He wanted to do all of that. And I, I like to perform. So I was doing the acting and then because I like to, I guess, organize and, and control things, control things. <laughs> I discovered, Hey, I like producing and directing too. So, so it all just came together and we just, we just started doing it. We all kind of went to school with Mike, I think in a way when he was going to filmmakers because we were helping him on his projects. So Bill and I got a good education too. So. Yeah, it was, and it's uh, nine, the nineties were a great time to get into indie filmmaking because we were riding the home video boom right mm -hmm. at the end of, of VHS. So we, we knew Kevin Lindenmuth and Tim Ritter and Ron Bonk and J.R. Bookwater and all the pioneers of, of indie horror uh, who were, who were <laughs> squeezing every last dime out of that dying industry as we were coming along. We just, we just happened to get there a couple of years too late. <laughs> well, I, I also think that you, show a lot of talent in the economy of filmmaking. If you look at the, the films that you've made, I won't be gauche and ask about how much they were, uh, but at the same point, it's, <laughs> but, but at the same point, uh, it's, it's, uh, obvious that you guys are stretching every dime, uh, to be able to get that what, what's there. And it's fun to see <laughs> how you are, uh, utilizing, uh, <coughs> some props in, in such an interesting way. And what I wanted to talk about was a splatter film or splatter movie, because oh, there's uh, that whole idea of it being inside of a haunt. Right. And you uh -huh. just kind of took over a haunt for what, November or <laughs> how did that work? It was a uh, summer. It, no. We <coughs> did it in, yeah. Well, okay. I got to tell the story because it's a cool. Yeah, story. Please. <laughs> we were working with, well, I was working with, um, Davy Snively and Jane Rose. Jane Rose. Sorry, I could not remember Jane's name for a second. Sorry, Jane. Um, Jane Rose and Davy Snively. Davy decided that she wanted to make a kind of little thing at e Eli Roth, uh, kind of like a little poke fun at him after he did uh, the Chick Vision on Cabin and no, kind of not Cabin in the Woods. Cabin Fever. Uh, sorry, Cabin Fever. Right. Anyway. So uh, she wanted to poke. So we were like, okay, you know, we were all women in horror. We're going to do this. So we got together. Uh, she called an effects artist around here, kind of produced the thing. And this woman knew a guy that worked at Hundred Acres Manor in South Park, Pennsylvania, outside of Pittsburgh. So that's where we found the location. We had been there a couple of times because it was a haunted house. But, but we had access to But it. we were there and we got there. They had been delayed at the airport or something. So Mike and I were there without anybody else there. I can't remember. I know it was kind of cold. So it was like February, March, something like that. But we were there without anybody else and we kind of scaled a little low fence. We hopped not, a fence. Yeah. We hopped a fence <laughs> to get in and looked around and just the idea started just like driving into our heads. I've never, yeah, that, that, that's kind of a weird pretentious thing to say, but honestly you'd walk into a different room and we'd have 20 ideas of the scene we could shoot in there. Yeah. So we just wandered around that for a while. Mike came up with a script, like within, I think we shot that weekend at, at Hundred Acres Manor for the short that we did. And uh, we had the script within days. I think 
we shot that summer. Yeah. Because, oh, oh, and then the uh, the guy who actually owned and ran the place, we didn't realize that they didn't ask them if we could be there. Oh. Um, he showed up, and, and after they explained who he was, and e- the, the guy Ethan, he, he worked there, so it wasn't like he, you know, wasn't affiliated at all. So that was good. We got to know Ted, right? Ted. Ted Sobel. Ted Sobel, who runs the place. Um, and it's, it's a 100% charity thing, by the way, just so everybody knows that if it ever opens up back again. But um, it's, a great it, it's a great place. But he, we met him and we explained who we are and what we wanted to do and how great the place was. And we got to talking with him and we were like, hey, can we shoot here? And he's like, yeah, sure. So, as long so, as you want, do whatever you want. Yeah. But they were, they were fixing the place or they were building for the next season at the time. So we'd shoot out a room and we learned early on, shoot the room out entirely, because if you need to do a pickup, there's chances are that not only the room doesn't exist, but it's it could be on another side somewhere, yeah. and it's been repurposed for something else. So we would we would leave little signs of still shooting here, please leave this room. Yes. <laughs> Started in, I think it was like June and July, maybe August. So it was getting close to haunt season. So they were working on moving things around, and but they were wonderful. They were great with us. We we were allowed this put blood in different areas and they were fine with it. And they're like, yeah, just leave it. I don't care. And so we were working with the designer of the place who knew exactly what we were doing. So, you know, we didn't upset him at all. So, and it was, since we were shooting a movie about shooting a movie about shooting a movie, a lot of times the light stands, if it was in the shot or whatever, right. it, it could just stay. It was the lowest stress <laughs> type shoot in that way because everybody was just so welcoming. Everybody on set was, yeah, having a great time. They got to like, it, we welcomed input because it was such a loose script. We wanted different input. I mean, we, we knew what we wanted to do. We knew what the beats were, but if somebody had an idea, it was like, yeah, Ooh, bring it on. Shoot it. <laughs> yeah. Everyone had cameras. So shoot yeah. what you want to do. Yeah. And we, we incorporated a lot of stuff that we didn't come up with. Yeah. There was a lot of B-roll, some little um, improv stuff here and there that we, we put a little bit in. So yeah, yeah it, it was a great shoot. It really was. It, it was impossible to edit. But. Uh, I wouldn't doubt. Uh, one of the things that I think is really cool about that, and it's so simple, right? Uh, but going inside of a haunt allows you so much set design and a, a, a universe, right? You never yeah. have to see broad daylight. You never have to see any kind of change uh, that can happen atmospherically, right? It's every right. room is different, but everything is, is is the same. And it it really has a mood to it that is a lot. I mean, there's an eeriness to it, even though I know there's a lot of humor that's in there as well. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think that's really fun. And I think it's also kind of funny that uh, you were about 20 years ahead of the, uh, the wave. There was this wave of haunt films that mm-hmm. came out in the last couple of years. Uh, and I always think it's interesting because the haunt films that came out, it's, it's like this weird cultural divide that they're really talking about the house that October built and stuff like that, where it's really, it's really a a kind of a haunt version of deliverance, right? You have (laughs) these smart ass punk kids or goofy college kids or whatever, in all these movies and they go to the place. They really, Oh, you really want to be scared. Do you, you really want to play? Do you? And then they meet these folk who are out there in the woods that are just doing the stuff of killing people. And it hits me uh, when I was watching. I'm like, isn't it interesting that culturally, all of a sudden, we had all these movies that wanted to punish bratty, smart-ass kids, right, with uh, the real world. You know, oh, you want want fantasy stuff. Let's give you the real stuff over here. Come on over here. I'll take you behind the woodshed. And uh, (laughs) yours has a different mood to it. But uh, it, it hits me as funny that uh, you you were talking about something that I hadn't seen since uh, the Fun House, right? Toby Hooper's mm-hmm. The Fun House, the only movie mm-hmm. that I can think of that really spent a lot of time in a in a, in a dark ride. And uh, you would think that that would have been uh, something that everybody was doing because it was just a, a real uh, to me it was a, a a real stroke of brilliance on low budget filmmaking of being able to really stretch that dollar and make it seem like, uh, you know, an epic in, in, in me in, in many ways. Yeah, it was, it was wonderful that we were able to use their set design for our stuff. And it was, you know, and then they, it, it was great that the people that we were doing that for thought 
it was nice that we were showing off their set design. Yeah. So it was kind of a nice symbiotic little thing there. We, um, we did a clean cut for them so they could use it as promotion and things like that. Yeah, that, it took out yeah. the little bit of nudity and some of the you know yeah. bigger square words. The rape and, scene. Yeah. Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. I was, yeah. was going to ask how they uh, how they felt about it, and uh, so they're they're good with it. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, yeah. We we warned everybody, you know, above, and um, the guy that runs it is a very wonderful, very nice, uh, very Christian man that was tolerant of everything that we he was, did. He was, just, he was real supportive. Like, I, yeah, I don't care what you do. This is for the kids. Yeah. I'm like, okay, so the, the, the reverse rape scenes for the kids. You know yeah. what? I'm fine with that. You yeah. know what? I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, he, he just got a kick out of it. He thought it was he thought it was great. He thought we could, you know, have a good time. A little bit of publicity for the haunt was good. He was happy. He can say that there was a movie shot there and uh, yeah. Well, it's yeah. one of the oh, things sorry. that really uh stood out when i was talking to you folks the first time was that you really had a a welcoming and kind uh aspect to how you were speaking to me you're very open to the conversation and so i bring that up because most times when i ask people about their movies and they're like so what ha oh they hate us we went on a location we destroyed everything we're in lawsuits and stuff like that and yeah and i was like you know you can watch the friedkin documentary and you know uh he, he gets a Way with a bunch of stuff because uh, people think he's so energetic and talented, uh, but he's being an asshole to everybody, right? And yet you have not done that. You seem to leave a good energy everywhere that you go. Is that part of the the happy cloud uh, mentality? It, it's oh, go ahead. Sorry, it, it's a way of getting people to work with you again. Yeah, I mean, if if you're if you're asking them, well, can we take over your entire place? Mm. You shouldn't be a dick about it. I, I really, I really feel that that's that's true. If you come off as professional and likable, to tell the tell the cherry picker. I, yeah, that's what I'm. That it's a perfect illustration of what you're talking about. But there's also the caveat that most of the places we've shot in, um, we've paid little to no rental on. So it's usually donated or you know favors or whatever. So. I'm not going to go in for a place that you're letting me use and just be a complete dick about it. I don't think I would be even if I was paying for it, but yeah, it's when you're, especially with low budget, we learned early on that if you're nice to people, they'll come back. And if you're jerks to people, cause we've been on other people's set and we know what it's like when people aren't paying you and they're assholes. It's like, yeah, I'm getting what out of this. Right. <laughs> it's, there are billions of other low budget sets I could be on and not being treated like this. So bye. But um, yeah, the cherry picker story is awesome because that the opening credits of Splatter movie has one of my favorite shots is the the crane up over to the top of the entire facade and you can see the maze and you can see the scope of the entire haunt and, and you know change the ending of the, of the movie it, it really did and that was not planned at all that was that we got there one morning and we were shooting at like seven eight o'clock in the morning we would get there really early in the morning because it was also really hot 100 degree days and there was no air conditioning so we were trying to get as much of the heavy stuff out before it got to be like 11 o'clock 12 o'clock you know as much as possible. So we would get there pretty early. We got there one morning and there was no power. And we were like, okay, there were people working at the light pole, not a big deal. Um, starting to set up, still no power. Um, not even worrying too much about it. And then there was a little house nearby that you can rent for a party. Somebody had rented it for, I think it was a graduation party. Something like that. A woman came out of the house after they got there. They were there like five minutes screaming at the guys working at, on the telephone pole, just screaming bloody murder. I rented this house and there's no power and this is ridiculous. I mean, granted, it's like, what, like nine o'clock in the morning at this point, their party wasn't starting till one. So, but she came out full on, full on bitch. Karen, no, sorry, we didn't have that name right. back then, man. Right. But no, she was full out screaming at them how this is unacceptable and she's calling the park office and this is terrible and they can't set up. And we're like, so we grabbed a few donuts and some water and we went out to the guys and we're like, Hey guys, we're shooting a movie over there and they're working on the haunted house. Do you know when this is going to be back on? And he was like, well, it was going to be a half an hour after her. It was going to be maybe another couple hours, but we'll get it on as soon as possible for you. <laughs> so we gave them the donuts and we were like, yeah, chatting about her and everything. And it was, it was cool. It's like, okay, all you had to do was ask because like literally the guy said they were getting ready to turn the thing back on when she came out screaming at them. Yeah. But 
it, so we were just chatting with them and then we were like, Hey, that nice little cherry picker you have, uh, any chance we could do that? <laughs> and they're like, well, don't tell anybody. So yeah. they let Mike get up there with the camera and get that really nice. Yeah. They let me cause Jeff wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mike was. Our DP wouldn't get it. He was a good DP, but he would not get in that fucking, I'm terrified of heights. <laughs> Oh, wow. But it, it's one of my favorite shots. And, yes. I, and not a lot of people, I think, realize the scope of what went into that. So they don't really get that shot. But it's a gorgeous shot when people compliment it. And all I can think of is that's what you get for being nice instead of being a screaming banshee. So um, I know that uh, you, I, both of you have directed the films. But, Mike, you usually write them. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you find yourself... And you've done a lot of writing. Uh, do you find yourself more uh, excited by writing or, or by the visual at this point? Writing and editing, I enjoy because I don't have to involve anybody else. I, I will write a draft and Amy will tell me what's wrong with it. We will go fix it. We will go back and forth with it. But it's just it just is me. When we get on set, my anxiety shoots through the roof. I don't want people asking me questions. You'd have the script. Just do that and leave me alone. <laughs> Yeah, understood that, um, he's much better she almost uh every movie we've done she directs the actors um uh, i don't know how to talk to actors in a lot of cases so uh when when you see we we're like the cohen brothers whoever is directing on there means that they took the heavier hand and normally be, it's because i you know the only movie i ever directed myself in i guess was feast of flesh everything else you mm. you directed me all the way through that but that's the only time i've ever appeared on screen as a major character as a major yeah. character well, that's well, interesting that. because uh, I was going to mention, well, a couple of the movies, but I just rewatched uh, Razor Days, which I absolutely love. I think it's just a, a... That one, Mike directed the majority of it. I okay. kind of stepped back and just tried to be in character for as much as possible. Yeah. So Mike, and Mike did a fantastic job yeah. directing too. I, I learned how to direct on that one. Uh, yeah, there were, well, yeah. Anyway, yeah. sorry. Well, when we're talking about beautiful shots, uh, like you mentioned in a splatter movie, there are several really, really strong shots yeah. that are inside of Razor Days. I mean, there's that yeah. entire scene in uh, the rain uh, with the arguments that are happening between the characters. And the acting is just superb in, in, in that sequence. I was really stunned at how... Well, first off, Mike, I think it was great. You had like this Altman-esque three women kind of thing going on in this movie. And there was uh, this sequence where one of the characters walks away while uh, uh, the other two characters are fighting and the sound just kind of floats away and we're on this person's face and her face is astonishing in that sequence. And then there's another shot with uh, Amy up against a, uh, a house with uh, the mm -hmm. characters in the, in, the, in the far distance. And just the look of that, that's a still right there. I was just the, the, the coloring, everything about that shot just looks fantastic. It feels iconic, like you're in the, one of the saddest Westerns ever at that point. But uh, I, I really, I, I appreciate that movie a lot. And uh, I think that uh, there's, there's a lot to talk about inside of that. And I'm just surprised. I did not know that Amy, uh, you did the, directing of most of the actors in the films and you're you're so often acting and i was wondering how that works for you because there's a lot that goes on in any set and i would think for like razor days or even splatter movie there's a, there's just tons of stuff going on how do you keep yourself acting as well and talking to the director or act directing the actors that is mike likes to give me a lot more credit for act directing the actors he, he does more than he likes to talk about but um i think it's just more when mike's more visual with everything and he he knows what he wants but he's not exactly sure how to tell people what he wants where i understand mike's shorthand so i don't know if i'm more directing or translating or translate, okay you know to the to okay this is what mike is looking for so when we're doing it um and i'm in something where he's directing the scene it's i, I kind of know what he's going for so i'll try to direct them to get them to do what he wants if that makes sense i mean because we have such a i mean we've been together for 26 years now so we have a shorthand so right. yeah. <laughs> well so it's a lot easier when we're both there because i feel like and i know when i'm on set and i'm directing and i'm in the scene i i completely rely on him because i know he's got my back so it, it it makes it really easy for me to when I need to be in the scene, be in the scene. And when I can step back and direct, I can step back and direct. But if I need to be in the scene, he's right there. 
So, I mean, the, the look of that film, uh, it just feels very tight. There was like there's something yeah. special happened in that film, and I'm not quite sure what it is. But uh, Bart, so Mas- yeah. Bart Mascarenardi is the special thing that... Uh, Bart and Alan. And Alan. Yeah, you yeah. can't discount Alan. No, you can't, Alan's a force. That, that, honestly, that film is, it's like, hey, everything's a story with us anymore. <laughs> I, I realize we're getting to that age now where everything's a story. But that film came together so just after misstarts after a lot yeah, of yeah because we had been starting we had, you read that script in like late 90s i think or early 2004 oh wow that late but we'd been talking about doing this script for years and everything else we'd done we were um we were okay with doing it lower budget we were okay with not having the best of this and the best of that you know it was we want to do the movie we want to get it out we want to do it as good as we can but we're okay with not having it be the best if that makes sense you know it was like you know, we want to put more money towards as much as we could towards the actors than the other stuff. So when Razor Days, we started to do Razor Days, we realized that one was going to take a lot more. So that was always like the future project. You know, the, the one down the road we do when we had the budget for it. The award winner. The, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, because it was such an intense script and it it couldn't be it mostly our other stuff has comedy like you even said splatter movie is a serious movie but it has comedy so a lot of stuff can be forgiven when it's funny too at least in my mind that's how i look at movie if something's going to make me laugh i can forgive lower budget stuff i can forgive like the sound problems we have i can forgive a lot of that if it's funny if you want to be serious and you're going to do that kind of stuff it takes me out of it so we didn't want to do our serious movie with the lower budget with, you know, the problems that we were going to have. So we needed the money. We needed everything to come together and it did in one weekend and it, it, it did. And it was such like a movie storybook way. It came together with you know, talking to the investor, Bob Kuyper. We'd been talking about doing a movie with for a while. Um, and it was the first time, literally the first time we'd ever been face to face after working with him for like two or three years. He, he was the owner of Sirens of Cinema. So he was my publisher for, for four years. We'd never met him face to face until that day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we all sat down at whatever convention we were at. I don't even remember. Um, and we were just chatting about things and we were kind of taking sirens down at that point because it wasn't bringing in money for him and he was losing money and we we're like this is ridiculous you can't keep losing money let's let's redirect your your focus so we started talking about this movie we were planning on doing at some point you know and it was kind of just throwing it out there because we were like yeah there's no way he's gonna want to do this it's a budget blah 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 whatever he was like oh that sounds interesting so that's how it started. So that was kind of putting the seed. And then we go over to the convention where we saw Bart and Allen, who we hadn't seen in months. Yeah. Oh, it'd been like a year or so since we'd seen the seen them. We had seen them, sorry. And it's like we introduced Bob, this is you know, Alan, this is Bart. And it was almost one of Alan's first lines was, you know, I've been thinking, I just reread Razor Days the other day, and we really need to get on that. And it was like Honestly, we did not set him up, but it seemed like we set him up. So that was another thing. And then somebody else brought up something about... Nicotero, we're running in the Nicotero, well, because yeah. we were hometown people, Nicotero recognized us, and Bob was impressed that Nicotero came out. He stopped his line to come over and give Amy a hug and shook my hand. And the investor was like, okay, they're not idiots. Yeah. They, they're not lying to me. People want to see this thing. Uh, it, it really did. Nicotero kind of, it, we, we told him this at the yeah. one show, but he sealed our deal because it was like, we went up and Nicotero has, it was right after Inglorious Bastards came out. So he had a little bit of a line, nothing bad. I'm like, okay, we'll stand in the back of this line. It can't be more than half an hour. And he got up from his line and called us over and signed Bob's stuff and gave me a big hug. And Bob was like, he knows you. I'm like, yeah, we've been telling you. So yeah, we're not lying. We do know these people. We can make this movie. And he was like, all right, how much you need? <laughs> so that, and we were able to, because we had the budget on that. And I mean, Laurel Caverns was a beautiful location that we didn't have to pay a penny for. We donated money wow. for them. Yeah. Uh, but we didn't have to pay for it uh, a lot of the other things so we could put the money into our camera equipment and our above the line and below the line people paying people for travel and pay um i know that just sounded stupid but i'm so used to just paying people travel budgets yeah. so we, we were yeah. paying them salaries salaries yeah it was uh, we were able to a few of the people that were in it that we had been working with for years 
we kind of bumped up what we were going to pay them to kind of try to pay them back for things with Bob's blessing, of course, but um, just trying to put the money into what you're going to see on the screen. And there was a lot of that that came out, like the scene that you're talking about, honestly, um, a lot of that was improv. The majority, that was, that was the third take. And you were all, you were absolutely it entirely because we didn't expect the rain. No, it wasn't supposed to rain. We had, just, we had done this entire choreographed fight scene. Bet choreographed it with me and Debbie. Um, we had punches. We had the whole thing done. And then it started to rain. And we got into that mud muck. And we were like, yeah, we can't do it. Let's just see what happens. So Mike, I think Mike's instincts on follow, keeping Bart to keep that camera on Bet as she started to wander away it wasn't planned. It was all his instincts on that, what, looking at her face and seeing us in the background and yeah. doing the fight that we're doing. So it's even more impressive that you know that that was all his improv that camera work. <laughs> well, it, it, I know that she had, she had obviously lost, you'd done the scene three times and it, it was stripped down from the dialogue. Now it was just, there was just raw emotion. And she did, her character didn't know how to deal with it. And I'm like, okay, Bart, we, we did the two takes with them. Let's see where this is going. So I could, yeah. I could easily cut through it. And that's, yeah. And, and sometimes like that, you just, it, you get the gold that you want. Yeah. You well, uh, there's a couple of things that are in there. I mean, yeah, if I, if you look at some of your earlier films, you know, you, you're on sticks and it's, that's, that's the shot, you know, you're going to get the establishment. This was off the sticks. You're going up hills in the rain, <laughs> following two people and just has so much energy because of that. It's uh, got an immediate tension to it and it goes with the story. Uh, so we've been talking about this or I've been, blabbering about it how about giving a little bit of a, a, a synopsis of what the story is for people who haven't seen razor days and may want to look it up okay um it's what happens after the end of the texas chainsaw massacre how mm. how does somebody that abused come back and the answer is they probably don't it's a story about three the three distinct people with with three very specific traumas and they come together to sort of exercise these traumas um, with very vague motivations. Uh, it, we, we, we stripped the script that the script originally um, had, had a Sonny bean tie to it. It, it uh -huh. had, uh, had all these, these forced motivations to it. And once we realized, no, it's about three women healing through murder, basically. <laughs> and it's, but it's not rape revenge. It's, it's not, I spit on your grave. It's, it is more of the style of, of a Western. Um, and we, we, uh, when Bard and I sat down, I said, I wanted to have sort of this Badlands instant feel to it because we're, we're, do we're not doing anything else but telling the story of three people, three people who don't understand each other but think they do. And that's, mm -hmm. yeah. that's, well, that's why it's not funny. It's why, you know, when the violence happens, you're not even sure if they're vindicated or not. You're not even sure if they're getting the right people. Uh, right. They're... They're mentally ill. They're damaged people. And the least damaged one is trying to keep the most damaged ones together. And she's all of a sudden, all of her repression is coming out. Well, that uh, was something it, really interesting, Amy, in your performance, because you're, you're playing this person who's gone on to do uh, self-defense classes. Uh, that's been your version of healing. Uh, but you kind of uh, there are there are moments when I'm wa watching your face and you kind of disappear. There's like this, there are these moments where there's like a primal, I don't know what I'm going to do if she says one more time that this uh, is vindicated, what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, you, <laughs> you had this thing about Rashawn at that point, Debbie Rashawn, and, that, and that's, uh, there are a couple sequences when she's trying to talk her, uh, the, the third party into going for retribution, and you're on a porch, and there's just this one moment where it's like you're just gone. Yeah, something's being said and it just really, uh, so it was very impressive and it felt like uh, there was some personal shit going on in that film. Uh, obviously don't need to know anything about that, but it was a really <laughs> intriguing really? film. Well, it's, it's, no, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's acting. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, you know, it, it, the movie to me was always about personal trauma and how you get over trauma and how you deal with your trauma and other people's trauma so my character here, she's all, she's, you don't even know about her trauma to begin with. So mm -hmm. she's, she's fine. She's going along. And then other people's trauma. Yeah. Even if you are healed, even if you're moving on, even if you're being strong and 
sometimes you might go back to it and you have to deal with it at that point. So I think my character, at least what I was trying to do was, I'm not trying to talk her out of it. I'm trying to talk me out of going back down into that mm -hmm. hell that I was in. So it was, yeah, don't let me go back. Don't let, and, and it was more trying to keep me out of it. So you have to talk everybody else out of it. Yeah, it, there was, but yeah, there's, yeah definitely personal stuff. <laughs> no, but there, there wasn't a lot of personal shit on set. No, no, no. I'm talking like drawing on personal right. experience. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, it was, I mean. It was, it was a professional set. And we, we, we didn't come out like, like the Lord of the Rings characters. We didn't all get tattoos or anything. Just kind of but, it it you know, was a rough. We were, all prof we were all pros doing something we, yeah, we believed in. Well, it was interesting because, uh, like I said, there's an ambiguity, but also, uh, Amy, you, you mentioned something about trying to keep your, your character from going down that spiral. What is interesting is, is the dynamic of victims victimizing and also being aggressors and blaming each other. It's really interesting to see how it doesn't shy away from, uh, like, Rashawn's right down on you when you ask one question. What was the argument that you had with your friend before you were abducted? And uh, I, I keep forgetting the character's name, but she can't remember. And it's just this moment where Rashawn looks at you and goes, what's with the interrogation? you do know that what these men did is far worse than anything. So there's like this whole attack upon you over something that is obviously an old argument. This has happened to her before. And so it was really neat to, to watch that uh, dynamic uh, play out instead of just being this thing of, I don't know, guys, you know, so uh, it really had meat to it. And I, I, you know, I'm going on and on about, it because it really, it was one of those movies that really affected me when I watched it. And I was like, this is really cool. I know these people. <laughs> It, it it was it's definitely i'm yeah i'm gonna keep close starting here um i had a lot of hopes i yeah we poured a lot into that and i think we did exercise a lot of demons and i was hoping exercising those demons would kind of um carry over into more critical success success <laughs> um but yeah then the entire industry changed and then we didn't know what the hell to do and it was Mike said it was a it was a good shoot. We had a good time, but it was rough. We had what, ten days, I think we did almost two full, full days, weeks yeah. um, of everybody down in Waynesburg with us. And we had everybody either staying, a couple of people staying at our place, but mostly uh, staying at a bed and breakfast we rented um, about ten miles away from us in Waynesburg. So we were in kind of this red area of Pennsylvania with. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, and we would active go with clan members with active yeah. clan members. Mostly, I, I'm from Pennsylvania, so I know exactly oh, what you're okay. talking about. So, yeah, yeah, Wayne, uh, yeah. Green County, Pennsylvania, is basically West Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, Alan Roe Kelly is very striking. No matter how he goes out, he's he's definitely a, a big presence. He's not invisible. So, and there were there were looks, and there was a lot of mining activity at the time. There were a lot of out of town people. Um, so we got some looks when we went out. So it, it wasn't bad, though. I don't think I mean, we were a big group, so nobody gave us any. But I was kind of cognizant because I didn't want anybody messing with my friends, you know. So I was kind of on guard the entire time we were there. Then all the subject matter and then, you know, just working almost straight the entire time. I think we we took off for Easter and we went down for a big buffet dinner with everybody. And uh, but other than that, we were shooting almost every day. And it was, you know, there were days like when we shot in the rain, it was just pouring down rain almost all day and it was getting close to the end of the shoot. So it wasn't like we could push it off for another day. We or needed to do scene. it. Yeah. So it, it was a rough, rough, rough shoot that everybody put in 150%. So by the end of it, we were all exhausted and just needed a break. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys. Please go away. Yeah. <laughs> didn't even look at the footage. And that was also when, and this sounds terrible, but it was the start of all of the mining trucking activity around our house down in Waynesburg. Um, it started right around then. So we were having more and more trucks and mining activity. Whereas you know, we lived in the middle of the country, our closest neighbor was a quarter mile away. So we were used to quiet. I mean, half the stuff we shot was like right across the street from our house. So, and we had hours of quiet and then it started becoming you didn't have quiet anymore so we had to deal with a lot of that personally right after the shoot uh because it started yeah they, they would show up at our house like wanting to lease our land for this or that like every other day at that point um 
so there were a lot of things going on where we kind of put the movie away for a little bit and then brought it back out. And then again, the entire industry changed at that point. So, yeah. <laughs> so three of our investors uh, or our previous distributors, two went under. Uh, one that was was adamant he wanted it, he didn't want to, he would pay anything for it, ghosted us. <laughs> <laughs> Amazon stopped putting indie stuff up. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so what do you do with it afterwards? That's the biggest problem that all indies are facing right now is you don't have an audience anymore. Yeah, that was what I was. Yeah, that's what I was going to bring up uh, because uh, one of the things that I say a lot is that it's a really interesting time to be a viewer of films because you have these things like Netflix and Amazon Prime and Shutter uh, that are bring in uh, things that people normally wouldn't find. Uh, guys like me would go see the Asian horror film, but <laughs> many people wouldn't. Uh, and now they're actually getting to be seen. But I've talked to several uh, independent filmmakers who are like, you know, Amazon was there. <laughs> we were there when Amazon needed us, right? Mm -hmm. In the very beginning. And uh, they paid really nice. And they wanted small indies because they could fill the void. And then as soon as they started making their own films, everything changed. And so it's like you, you lose the home video market because of streaming, right? Streaming kills right. that. And then they kill the very uh, folk that allowed them to go somewhere. So it's like, where, where do you go? Yeah. Yeah, vindictively they did that. You can, you, uh, and as much as I love Herschel Gordon Lewis, his stuff is up there. So they can't say, "Oh, it's because it's low budget, or it's gory, or tits, or whatever." No, it's it was blatant. It was blatant discrimination. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it was uh, against the low budget horror film? I think uh, no. I, I think it was put, pressured them into saying, "If unless it comes from us or from a viable label, we don't want to hear about it." And you know, we're providing you content now. We go away. What do you have? You have the Indies. Well, good luck with that. Right. And that's with music. That was the same thing that happened in the 80s when CDs started to come out and you had all of these libraries being locked up in legal battles. And so mm -hmm. you lost so many albums. And I'm hoping that that doesn't happen with film, uh, especially uh, the films of people that I uh, that I admire. And I want to yeah. see people's work continue to go. Uh, so we mentioned Badlands and we mentioned Three women, uh, I mean, big horror films <laughs> for people who, so what, what's the kind of, I always like to ask people who are visual, what movies are you channeling? Like if you were making a post, uh, a film book, like when I used to want to make a story or something, I'd take a collage, National Geographic pictures and all of that and put them in a, oh. a scrapbook uh, to get that idea of tone and light and what kind of energy I wanted. Did you find yourself having the shorthand with each other? Like uh, this should be more Badlands. This should be, what, what, we, what, what do you talk about? Jeff, give me an Alien Three over here because we're we're gonna go on for a two shot. Okay, uh, this this is really great, Amy. I need you to turn to the camera and I need you to give me a Lady in a Cage. Yeah, the, definitely. We definitely have that. Uh, we've used the okay. I kind of want a poltergeist shot down the hallway. Okay, I've got it. <laughs> it's it's one of the things, and we've we've remarked about this on our sets. Is one of the things that we like about our shorthand is and other people when we kind of gravitate towards other people that use that same kind of shorthand where they talk about movies um, and just throw out references in order to better explain what they mean about something mm -hmm. or, you know, in, in order to figure out who your people are. I mean, heck, when I, you say, where do these stairs go and people don't say they go up, I kind of get a little leery. <laughs> right. the start, you know? I don't know if I need you as a friend. I mean, I'm trying to get used to it with the young people. Well, I know they got to find the movies mm. first, but somebody of our generation that doesn't know where the stairs go, I don't right. want anything to do. <laughs> just, just don't. <laughs> but uh, that's the, the shorthand of movie talk is something that we, we enjoy and we utilize a lot and we utilize with the people we work with too. If they have the same kind of lingo that we do, it's a lot easier. Yeah. Although I, I have to say it's very little horror. We, if, we, right. if we're going to forgot, like so much of Splatter movie was stolen from performance. Mm. <laughs> <Nick> <laughs> <Donald Campbell. laughs> oh my uh, goodness. I'm right so glad. Demon I... was edited to the Thomas Crown Affair. Yes, yes. So if it, it weren't the for energy... the Thomas Crown Affair, I would not have had all those split screen shots. We just had close-ups of people lunging. <laughs> 
I, I'm so glad you brought up performance. One of my, uh, cause I'm a huge Nick Rogue fan. So, uh, and, uh, I always love that when they did the review of performance, when it first came out, they said that the, uh, the critics were gagging in the seats. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, this is the, most- the file coming off the screen. <laughs> I'm like, man, uh, you watch it now and you're going, what are they talking about? What was so horrible about this film? But uh, yeah, I, 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 with that. every, I, every I will torture them with performance and most of them hate me for it. <laughs> It's, and so, of course, White of the Eye is probably one that you reference every so often. No, as well. no? C- Camel doesn't work without Roig for me. I'm sorry to say it. Uh, Demon Seed comes close, but the pacing's wrong. Uh, performance is as much Roig's movie as it is Donald's. Uh, oh, absolutely. Big. Okay. I, I, yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I'm a big appreciator of all that. I think that was one of the most disturbing films I ever saw, White of the Eye. There was just something mm. really horrible about the drowning in the bathtub, putting the mirror up uh, in front of the woman's face while she's underwater. There's just right. something so sadistic about that. And I was like, who wrote this fucking thing? What a nightmare. <laughs> but uh, oh, I find, yeah, <laughs> yeah and I find that a lot of the, uh, the people that I, uh, that I vacillate towards is we talk horror a lot, but we talk in reference with other films. You know, I, I think the love of cinema is the first thing. And when I talk about my, my show, I say, I love all kinds of movies. My heart belongs to horror. Uh, there's something about it that uh, makes me go down that path, but I love, and a lot of the people who watch uh, or listen to my show, tend to say, I can't believe that you just dropped sometimes a great notion <laughs> while you're talking about horror films. It's like, yeah, of course. I mean, there, do you find that there's a Venn diagram? Uh, uh, we're like uh, the central part of a Venn diagram. Uh, I think that there's like people who are uh, obviously wearing black, but also certain types of music, uh, certain types of uh, dramas that you will watch. Like if I go into a horror convention and I mention Straw Dogs or Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia, most are going to know that movie. But if uh, I'm going to bring up uh, Three Women, they may not, right? So I don't know because there are a lot of Altman fans, uh, especially Wastelanders. Wastelanders are extremely educated in film. Um, talk to Allie Melling sometime and, and oh, see if you can get one end to the other without without her dropping a thesis on something. <laughs> yeah. Woman more, more theses for things than I, I can I can throw a stick at. You know that's not the phrase, but you know what I'm talking about. Right. No, it's. I think it's uh, something that's really cool about uh, the uh, Wastelanders and people that just fall into this Venn diagram who uh, go into a certain type of rock and roll, uh, like fantasy as well, uh, enjoy things like Altman. Uh, and uh, when I find those people, it's really great. Is that part of why you started uh, Exploitation Nation and Grindhouse Purgatory? Because it seems like you have a group of people who are just so... I fall for passion, right? That's that's my, my thing. I, I, I fall for other people's passion. I'm, my fetish is other people's fetishes. So uh, <laughs> do, you, do you find that uh, that's kind of the genus of uh, the magazines that you put out? Because you have an interesting group of people. There. I can, well, I can't take any credit for, for Grindhouse Purgatory. That's all Pete Chiarella. Um, and I refuse to take any credit for it. Um, <laughs> Exploitation Nation is, is the magazine I always tried to do when I was working for Sirens of Cinema and Femme Fatale. It's, um, it's these deep dive film essays into things. that exploit, The word exploitation is there. I stole the title from Andy, from Andy Kopp. Um, that was his, his blog. I, always, I just like that, those two words. And we turned it into an exploration of film. Um, we have these vague themes, but what we found is if you have a publication that comes out regularly, people will talk to you. You don't get, you don't get the phone hung up on you as often. So it's, it's a good way of, of keeping a lot of working journalists working. Um, okay, okay. Uh, and it's, it's, it's taking deeper dives into just listicles and, you know, top five horror movies to play when you're menstruating or whatever it is that, that Buzzfeed comes up with. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I agree. I think uh, that is the thing that's cool is that I've always said that horror is uh, it can hold its own with any of the genres that are out there, especially drama that uh, there's no reason you can't deep dive. There's no reason you can't see the cultural relevance. I mean, even even movies that are the biggest B movie drive in films. I tell people, look at those in whatever year and you're going to find out exactly what people are anxious about 
in, in mm-hmm. politics yeah. and society. They have to. They need to know what's driving people crazy. They don't have to do it well. They don't have to do it athletically. But at the same point, they're going to speak on this. And I, I think yeah. it's really important. So I'm, I'm always pleased when I see the deep dives where we take this stuff seriously. Uh, I also believe that filmmakers like Toby Hooper said, you make a movie and then 20 years later, you find out what it's about. So I think that, that even if they don't take it as seriously, I think we're, we have the absolute right to uh, go down those paths. What well, you... did Herschel say to us? Hey, Herschel, we, we watched one of your movies. I said, oh, why would you do that? <laughs> oh, oh, no, I don't recommend that at all. No, 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 no. <laughs> Well, you, you mentioned Herschel, but the, uh, also there's, uh, um, oh my goodness, trauma. How come I can't remember? Lloyd, Lloyd Kaufman. Lloyd. And I, I, what, he was in um, severe in damage, severe, severe injuries. injuries. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I forget. Yes. Severe injuries. <laughs> yeah. So you yeah ha- I love Lloyd. I absolutely love him as, as a person, as a place and a thing. I, I adore Lloyd. Yeah, I've interviewed him, and he was a lot of fun to talk to. And he got really mad at me when I used the term. Did I use uh, the term exploitation? I used, uh, and he was like, these are not exploitation films. Just stop <laughs> saying that. They're, okay. they're very serious. I'm like political thrillers. <laughs> yeah, political, right. Jaws is a, a, a maritime drama. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. William, well, and plus, they're, they're all Shakespearean. Yeah. They're, they're all, they all have their roots in Shakespeare. I we have we're also trite. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that, you know, uh, yeah, to talk about deep dives into trauma films, if you kind of look, yeah, and there are a lot of, lot of things he likes to throw in there and then throws the, the gore and the boobs on top. So. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, he yeah. definitely has message uh, all over the place. I, I was talking to him over uh, his uh, sequel to Nukem High that he just did, uh, or the, the two-parter uh, that he did. Right. Uh, okay. Hi. And it was fun talking to him and, and getting his references and seeing wh- what he's done and where he wanted to go with cinema. Uh, but I also thought of him when you were sitting there saying, you know, uh, I worked with a guy and I'm getting abuse. <laughs> Why am I here? I'm not getting paid. Because he, he, I can't believe that he still does things the way that he does things. Yep. I mean, at the 40... 40- it's it's just an institution at this point i think it's just the way it is and it started out you know from hunger and everything and and just the love of making movies and then there was a whole spate of bunch of people that just wanted to be jerks kind of that got involved with him they and lost i think the punk yeah they lost yeah they did lose a lot of the punk thing and just were assholes if, <laughs> and then it kind of like picked it back up again real not real quick, but he picked it back up again where it seems like a lot of the people, at least that we know that work with him, um, just, <clears throat> they do it for the love of film. So you just want to work with trauma. It, yeah. it, it goes into it blind anymore. You know what you're going to get. True. Yeah. Now with the internet and everything, you, you know, and you've heard stories of, yeah, we got the spray bottle. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Of, of how it is on a trauma set at this point. If you go into it and don't know it, then that's on you, I think. I didn't point. know the army was going to be so hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I, 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 my my thing though is like Lloyd, you've been doing this for forty years. By now, you should be able to find the bottom line for a porta potty. Just a porta potty, <laughs> dude. I mean, it's all you need. What does that have to do with making a movie, Scott? <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm I'm crazy that way. I have no clue. He a- he asked me to uh, after I in, uh, interviewed him. He's like, I'm doing this thing, Shakespeare shitstorm, which ended up getting uh, postponed for quite a bit of time. He's like, Come on yeah. down if you're in in the area. Come on down. We'll put you in the movie. <laughs> Will you run down the street? With your dick hanging out. I don't know. We'll okay. find out. I guess it's like, what are you? That's what you came to me with. You know, that's after our conversation. That's what you want me to do. So, but uh, you know, he he cracks me up, and he's uh, he's so intelligent. But you wouldn't get it from you know what people think of his films, oh, and well, yeah. it's amazing I don't know to me. I think of Yale in uh, I think of William Shakespeare's shit storm. So yeah. I almost didn't get. Uh, him and Oliver Stone. Which one? Uh, seems like <laughs> yeah. I yeah. laugh. Yeah, he he knew Ollie, and uh, he was like, yeah, he's a terror. Uh, he was a fucking nightmare back then. <laughs> he was a mean, mean kid. He's like, oh, wow. okay. I like listening about uh, Rocky, the Rocky stories, with John Edwardson. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's some amazing stuff uh, that he's been involved with, and it it breaks my heart. Uh, it was wonderful that I got to speak with him, but it was it, it kind of hurt, you know, in a good way i guess that he was like you're really prepared i'm like and that's like most people aren't 
they don't even know what trauma is, you know, oh, he goes, yeah. and after 40 years and being that name and just even toxic <laughs> Avenger, or even just being a thorn in people's side, you think he would get more, uh, more respect than ha- being able to be gracious to me because I looked up, you know, the, the clubs that he was in, in Yale. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's speaking as somebody who has been doing conventions for 20 years, honestly, and it's a sad to say, but, people being prepared when they want to interview you and actually knowing what you're talking about is uh, kind of a rare gem. (laughs) I mean, there there are a lot of people who just do it and they love movies. They're great. They're passionate and they want to interview. And I mean, how many interviews I've gotten that have started out? What, what's your favorite movie? You know, what's your favorite horror movie stuff that, yeah. Okay. If it's a new audience, I want to talk about, but it's it's the same questions over and over. So that's, it kind of burns you out a little bit. And you just expect everybody to be like that. You expect everybody to be like, what was the first movie that you directed? What was the first movie that you starred in? What was the first movie that you da 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 What da, was da. it like playing this person? I mean, I, we got to be good friends with uh, a group in Canada because they asked to come to a show. They were going to be at a show and they said, hey, can we interview you? We're going to have this room. And I was like, all right, sure. So I figured it was going to be some guy with a little, you know, portable cam thing or a little, little portable thing. We walked in, they had a lighting set up. They had sound people. It was wonderful. And we're still friends to this day. Actually, we went to their wedding last year. So And they have bigger films. They have the new Evil Dead. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hail, yeah. Hail to the Deadites. Hail to the Deadites. Almost didn't get that out either. Going back on uh, on some of uh, that kind of stuff that we were just talking about being prepared. Uh, one of the things that happened today was I think movie uh, Movie Maker Magazine came out with the top fifty uh, genre film festivals. Uh, first off, that there's fifty genre film festivals blows my mind that are are valid at this point. It's really great because it used to not be that way. But uh, one of them that was in there was Women in Horror Film Festival, and that's something that I'm involved with. And I'm just thinking, uh, Amy, you started PrettyScary.net back in the day. How do you feel things have been going for women in horror since that? It, when we started, it was PrettyScary.com, so it even goes further back than that. <laughs> That's an interesting story. Ask Heidi about that one. I, I need to ask her about that one. We haven't talked about that for a while. But anyway, um, well, at the time, it was needed. We really needed something because the, at least Heidi and Jen Willen and I were just, we were friends, we were talking, and we were so tired of being on a message board and being talked down to. And it was constant. And it was, you're either talked down to or you were hit on in your private messages. And it was you didn't have a lot of community behind you. You didn't have people backing you up because we all didn't know each other. This is early 2000s. It wasn't the community as we have as much today. Um, the internet, the Zoom, everything else wasn't around as much. So we had these message boards. So you were kind of more spread out. So that's why we started Pretty Scary. And seeing it in the last 20 years and actually uh, the last little, uh, little girl, oh my gosh, it's terrible. Uh, the last girls in horror thing that I did, um, I did with a woman who's doing a thesis on pretty scary and the whole (laughs) early thing, which just kind of brought it all around in my head. It was just one of the weirdest things that I've ever done because she's sitting there next to me, teaching me to these, (laughs) these kids. So that was kind of cool. Weird to become history. isn't (laughs) it? Yeah. But anyway, seeing it now, it's wonderful that there's, there's still the woman in horror month. There's still women in horror film festival, which is awesome. But it doesn't have to be as isolating as we made it. Like we were trying to get our own bubble so we could do things and we could expand and it, it expanded. And it's great to see that, you know, the, the woman thing isn't as, I, I don't want to say it's gone. Like, I, yeah, I don't want to, it's kind of giving the impression right now that I think that women are accepted and everything. And I don't want to do that, but compared to 20 years ago, I, I'm seeing leaps and bounds and it's, and it's hard for women now that are, being where I was 20 years ago to see the, how much, I don't want to say better because that sounds horrible too, but how many more opportunities they have while they're still being definitely marginalized. But um, there's a lot more opportunity than there was 20 years ago. And it's really neat, neat seeing that. And it's really nice seeing it's not as much the, okay, let's have the women panel. Now let's have the men panel. Now we're going to have a film panel. Now we're going to have a a film festival. Now we're going to have, directors come up and talk and there's men and women in there and it's it's 
definitely different than when we started it you know, 20 years ago when it was just any time that you'd want to do any sort of panel, it had to be a woman panel. It had to be how women were in film. It had to be how women were this. Uh, so it's great. It's, it's really great to see. It's, it's not perfect yet. And, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that think it's really horrible. And I completely agree that their experiences probably are, but just the change that it's been, it's really nice to see. Um, Heidi's done a lot with that. Uh, a lot of people have done a lot with that and have been watching like all of that all explode. Expand. Expand. There you go. Expand. It, it's really nice. The bubble just got a lot bigger. It's, we went over there and we made our own sandbox and then other people came in and they were playing too so it's and now the whole sandbox is a big sandbox that everybody can play in again that would say beach, <laughs> <a> beach. <laughs> yeah now <laughs> i i love the idea that uh movies are coming out that are just serving different perspectives right yeah. it's just a yes. nothing more than a, a lens change you don't have to reinvent the wheel it's just allowing yeah. this and, and it's amazing what we are getting now and i hope uh yeah. you continue to see that it expand it's the same stories being told from different points of view. So they're fresh, like vampires versus the Bronx. Have you seen that one yet? Haven't vampires. seen it yet. Or in the Bronx. Sorry. Um, it's really good. It, it's basically, what did we say? The monster squad. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's a bunch of kids and vampires attack their neighborhood. So we've seen that before. How many times, but the way they do it and they kind of use it as a gentrification kind of thing. And you're seeing how these, these young urban kids are dealing with, vampires it's nice we haven't seen how the young urban kids deal with the vampires so let's see that for a while yeah. that was pretty cool yeah it is a i'm tired of guys who look like us scott yeah we've seen that <laughs> right exactly and, and it's amazing how often that see uh, people are upset over that change and another thing that i hear all the time is you know why did it have to get political i'm like you don't it's always been political you do yeah. know what caligari was all about cabinet of dr caligari we go all the way back to that we go back to frankenstein there's political aspirations inside of that as well you just happen to have a problem with immediate stuff you like looking at tragedy from back then or it comes down to you're now part of the history that is being questioned right mm -hmm. and, and that's the thing it's much easier with the armchair quarterbacking of uh taking a look at what was happening uh with george romero in 1968 as opposed to jordan peele in 2017 somehow that makes people a little bit more nervous even though i think both of them were kind of breaking down the same uh, breaking the mold a little bit in in the uh, genre that they were looking at and the story that they were trying to tell and i think it, yeah. we're seeing well, that well um, george was a white guy doing it though so yeah. it was uh, Okay. So, you know, that was, that was okay. If you wanted to tell the other points of view, if you were a white man, <laughs> yeah, if uh, you're not a white man, then you want to tell somebody else's point of view that they have a problem with it a lot of right. times. <laughs> yeah. The nonstop fight now of, uh, well, an actor should be able to play any role. Well, a director should be able to play any uh, direct, any kind of film. It's like, yeah, uh, you do realize why you had the opportunity to do that in the first place, right? No, they don't. No, no. They don't. no. There's a, a, a history ends in 1992 or something like that, somewhere around there. I, I, I was part of a stupid argument about Lovecraft Country. Oh, and I boy. said, why are the Tul Tulsa story again? They did that in Watchmen. Like, oh, I'm sorry. You can't have two points of view of a, of a terrible tragedy. One was enough for you, was it? That, that was your oh, white guilt was served by that right how many different tombstones have they made right or, yeah right how many times we see billy the kid fighting at sinking springs why is that okay but this one incident told twice that's beyond your pale oh your pale that's why it's beyond right exactly and uh you know we also didn't talk about it for the longest time because it's been hidden for the longest period of time yeah. the tuskegee airmen another one oh well yeah. we, you know we don't talk about that well it's been done already i mean th there's talk of how there that's in get out you know the idea of the uh the uh, medical procedures that are being done is a little bit of a, a shading towards that and it's like come on folks you do realize that we lied about these things actually happening that perhaps that's worth talking about again and it talks about myth and things and that's something that would be kind of fun to talk about M modern myths i mean we're, we're dealing in horror uh we're dealing in fantasy and uh all sorts of genre work and i'm always interested to see what you think certain stories mean to us at this point so uh we have of course the joseph campbell idea of the hero's journey and stuff and do you think that there's uh 
a myth that uh, a modern myth that people are going to be talking about, uh, like how they talk about Joseph Campbell, that's being done right now. Do you see anybody, any any creatures or uh, monsters or even storylines that you think uh, are going to be the things that people go, oh, of course that has to be repeated because. Oh, hmm, hmm, hmm. I, hmm. Well, the zombie trope has become our monomyth. It's, it's, and it's become, uh, because it was, because of the way it was conceived, it was a very um, American myth, even though it drew upon Haitian culture and, and right. previous things like that. But it was, it, it's become the idea of the American consumer culture, which we have spread across the world. A train to be sun is, is a prime example of zombies being the, right. the commuter the, and the consumer. The Babadook, maybe? The idea of, of childhood repression? Yeah, I, and that's what I was kind of thinking. There's a lot of, and I don't know if it's because our generation that did have like more latchkey and everything else, uh, just, and it's probably going to come out more if it's going to happen, is more of the isolation yet surrounded by the world. Like you have instant connection to everybody in the world, but we still feel lonely and isolated at all times. Not it's, really the Bobble Duke, but kind of. Yeah, but I think you're on to something. I, maybe we haven't explored. I, we'll, we'll see what the next 12 months are with, with Zoom movies and things mm-hmm. like that. Right. I but, think that there's something there that you're talking about uh, that I've been noticing, which is we are starting to talk about uh, trauma or un, uncomfortable uh, emotions yeah. In our main characters more. So uh, like uh, what was the one uh, ritual where it was uh, up in Iceland or whatever, they were hiking. And the, the, uh, the story is uh, one of the friends from college freezes while his other friend is murdered in front of him in a, in a, in a convenience store. So it's all about cowardice. And the beast that's in there has people trapped in the woods that are all cowards. They have somehow not done what they needed to do at these certain times. And um, what was the, the, the third day? Uh, it's kind of like a re-wicker manning. It's on HBO. It's a mini series uh, okay. with Jude Law. And uh, that's all about grief as mm-hmm. a vicious animal. And so I'm seeing that we're talking more about those kind of feelings and it feels like, the, the Baba Duke is probably like the 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 monster that people are glomming onto, especially people who are, feel that they've been uh, put under p- other people's boots. I'll see uh, the Baba Duke used in LGBTQ uh, fashion as well. You, you'll see yeah. uh, he comes up in memes. So maybe that's something. You know, maybe that's the the trope. Yeah, I think a lot of us just kind of feel frustrated. There was a lot of things that we were lied to about. We were told, you know, the greatest nation in the world and all you have to do is work really hard and everything's great. And then we hit like our early to mid thirties and they started pulling like the pension, you know, that started being the, I remember growing up is if you're loyal to a company and you just work your 30 years and you, they take care of you for the rest of your life. And then I'm watching my mom who worked at that point, she graduated or graduated. She retired from Verizon after 30 some years. And they, she was one of the last ones that retired with full pension. They just started like pulling pensions away. So everything that we were told when we were kids was a big lie. And I know every generation goes through that, but it, we were lied to about the country. We were lied to about the state of things. We were lied to about who our enemies were. I mean, the cold, cold war thing. Uh, yeah. And now we see the lies. And now we can see it. And that, I think, yeah, that's a whole big thing too, is now we talk to people over in Iran and we find out they're not all horrible, nasty people that want to kill us. So maybe the government's been lying about other things too. And all the trauma and everything that we've dealt with listening to these people that have been lying us for years it's all coming to a head. At least I hope it is. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. I, I think uh, you never know when there's going to be that, uh, that shift in perspective, right? So uh, yeah, every generation gets lied to and everyone uh, works with that, uh, processes that in whatever way they can. But I think this is a generation seen a couple generations swallow the line of the shit sandwich and has decided, no, we can change this. But what's going to happen? What, what, what will happen if we change things? And I think it's really exciting. I'm hoping that it continues. 
lose. I'm hoping that we don't get halfway up the fence and give up. You know, we're about to storm the castle. We are halfway up the fence. And then it's like, well, you know, we slayed the one dragon we were worried about. And we're going to leave the other dragons for the next generation. And I don't know. As, as much as the people that we've been talking to in the next couple of generations, the millennials that people like to complain about all the time, and then the Gen Z, they, to me, anyway, a lot of the ones that I've seen have a heck of a lot more fire than we did. So I'm hoping they'll just kind of keep pushing behind us too, because I'm getting tired. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Right, we, we turned to like Rain Lester, another wastelander who, who's on the front lines, and she, she was a medic during a lot of the... the uh, I don't know if we should... Well, she did post it on Facebook, yeah. but, but yeah. She was, like, she was think, a yeah. helper, whatever. Yeah, she was... Um, but she was on the first front lines of some of the riots, and again, I wouldn't... Here, Gen X, where we were told we had, we had no power the entire right. time. The entire time we were alive, we were told we had no power, and we believed it. You know, well, why should I bother then if, you know, I'm never going to make as much as my father, if I'm never going to succeed in this country that doesn't want me, why bother? And this, this new generation is, you know, what? we grew up without a lot of this stuff. Let's just do what we need to do. Yeah. We don't care about racism anymore. We don't care about, you know, we're going to fight for these things that you said you were going to take care of and didn't. And they're eliminating the lines, the yeah. racial lines, gender lines. And I'm happy for that. Same here. I think that that's, uh, I talk about hybrid vigor for horror, right? And, and that the idea that genre is starting to blur. And I think that's happening everywhere. I think it's happening in gender. I think it's happening in uh, social strata. And I, I hope that it continues to go down that path. Uh, it yeah. reminds me of that Dylan thing. You, if you've got nothing, you've got nothing to lose. I think what I'm impressed with is consistency. So uh, not uh, well, hell, we're talking at Wasteland as far as I'm concerned, so who cares? But uh, the idea of uh, having protests, right, and having things that turn into riots going into like month four, right? It's still happening in many places. You know, they have not given up. So it was seemed so simple and so easy to just ignore the kids. And you could feel that in the first moments of the uh the riots that were happening the protests that were starting to get civilly disobedient uh there was a dismissal of what was happening and then all of a sudden people started taking it seriously communities started taking it seriously municipalities started taking it seriously they were not ready they may have been ready for new york city san francisco portland and a couple other cities chicago and maybe a handful of other cities to have protests in them they did not expect them in scranton pennsylvania they did no. not expect them. Right. and that was what was amazing is that the fires just went up everywhere and yeah. uh, that to me was like wow i'm feeling it i'm also feeling you know the idea that i don't know I'm I'm not the arbiter of justice at this point. I need to I need to learn. I they have lived through something that I haven't lived through. My my right. rhetoric doesn't work anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. You know the idea of saving money off of a Starbucks is an absurd thing to speak of to somebody who's going through what they're going through at this time. Yeah. And uh, even with the, the the pandemic, I think the pandemic also helped uh, stir this pot just a little bit more because you're sitting with your thoughts all the time. There's no distractions to allow you to deny what's happening out there. And it's just really insane to me that I have friends that that do deny it completely. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? Something, I don't know. I stood too close to the microwave or something because it just doesn't seem to work for me anymore. And mm. it's just a, a, a madness. Getting other people's perspectives and the empathy. Like if I, you, you, when you were like, hey, this other person that doesn't look like me has a different point of view and you as an empathetic person, understand that point of view. It's, there's just so many people that don't care. They don't want to know because if my heart life is hard enough and I don't care what other people's life is like. So that's, that's what cares? they're rebelling about. It's not the mess. It's the forced introspection. Yeah. If you're, if you're stuck all day with your thoughts or your kids, I'm not sure which is worse. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, um, I know I've had you on for an hour and a half already, and I know that's probably, uh, getting tiring, at, yeah. but, um, I, I was wondering, one of the things that's been really super entertaining in the past month is you folks weekly giving a rundown of the movies that you're watching. Oh. <laughs> and they're mostly Halloween films, right? Mostly horror films. This, uh, this, oh, yeah. where, are you, where are you picking this, uh, these movies from? Because some of them are just awesome choices. 
Uh, it's it, literally, it's just a continuation of what we've been doing the last couple of years. It's what do you feel like watching right now? I don't know. So we spin the dial for a while. We try, I, I've been trying, I want to see new stuff because we've seen everything that we have for so many times that I right. really would like to see new stuff, but yet I like the comfort stuff too. So I want the new stuff to be good. So it takes a while, but we just, we, I don't know. We get a lot around here. We have pretty much all the streaming services. So we do that and then get recommendations and then just throw something on and see what happens. You're also yeah. ignoring our, our archive of almost 10,000. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, well, you don't you don't feel every day in the mood for a samurai film. Holy heck! I'm so sorry. There we go. That's it. Okay. Yeah, or German expressionism, whatever else we right. have. You know, I I have tons of Fellini films I will never watch. I I, I just I know this right now. I'm never going to get to them, and I'm okay with that. I would rather watch <laughs> Halloween three for yeah. ten thousand time. The I last don't. couple of weeks I have been I've been stripping because there are a few other things that we've been watching, but I'm stripping it to mostly horror just because. Of, October, just kind of trying to get into a Halloween spirit, but uh, yeah, we watch as many things as we can, as much as we can. That's pretty much all we have been doing the last six months. So that's yeah, it's, it's become our careers. It's been a, a thirty-year examination of film history. Yeah. Well, I, I love some of the picks that I haven't heard from in a long period of time, like the Waxwork films. I, I mm. love the first Waxwork. I thought that that was. That's uh, a lot of fun and Anthony Hickox, I forget, his father directed films as well. I'm trying to remember what film he did. I think he might have done Theater of Blood, the Vincent Price film. Oh, okay. okay. What if, yeah, jeez. Yeah, and, and so, uh, yeah. Another one that I absolutely love. So he has his dad's humor as well. But uh, there was something that was mentioned about an unrated version. And I remember Waxwork uh, in Fangoria magazine, they talked about how it was given an X rating because of the vampire sequence where they were pushing champagne bottles through them. And I have no idea why oh, okay. that. Yeah, I guess it was the food. I'm assuming what they really were talking about was the, the eating of the guy's leg. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I love steak tartare and you know that. Whole okay. Thing. All right. I, I remember a couple of stills with, with like the vampire brides literally just chomping down on him. Is that what they're talking about? Yeah. So, yeah. When you play that game where, oh no, this is the unrated version. It would have no difference to it whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> So. Well, I always laugh at that. Like uh, John Kitley, when I talk to him, he's like, yeah, yeah, you can't go off of running times or anything like that because right. uh, the, there's so many different cl uh, cuts and versions of these old yeah. films, especially like Paul Nashy films. They have like 30 different names and 30 different run times and one's colored orange and one's colored blue, depending upon where they put it in the closet. And so it's, <laughs> a, it's really uh, humorous stuff to, to go through all that. Have you found as filmmakers, you're watching all all these movies are there any movies that you've watched that you go i can see remaking this and making it culturally significant right now what ones um well as far as culturally significant i should have waited till you did the whole question um let's roll back the question then first we'll do the first one <laughs> okay so cultur culturally significant remakes. remakes okay go ahead so Remaking things, yes. If I'm watching something and it has a really great idea and just not a great execution, we just immediately start thinking, oh, we do this and we do that and we do that. Actually, it's it not culturally significant, but we watched yesterday um, Haunted Mansion. Oh, oh my gosh. Haunted Mansion and hated it until they got to the mansion. And I was like, you know, when they made Pirates of the Caribbean, the reason that it was such a success anyway, in my thing, is they made Pirates of the Caribbean and they had Pirates in the Caribbean in it. <laughs> and Disney's Haunted Mansion, it took a half an hour to get to the Haunted Mansion. So I was bored. Then when they got there, there's some really cool stuff. It's not the greatest, but we're sitting there going, oh, it needs to be this and you need to talk about this. And it's about... It, it's not about a real estate agent. I, it's about the ghosts. It's about the ghosts and, and their interactions with each other and how they're getting out and the, the people inside are this instead. So, yeah, we do that a lot. <laughs> you, you take Haunted Mansion, you shoot it like high spirits. So, you, you know, all the ghosts have different, uh -huh. you know, uh, motivations. Oh, tool. <laughs> I want to do Neon Maniacs. I always felt Neon Maniacs got the, the short shrift because you have you, know, you have these great characters and these great monsters and you don't do anything with them. You spend this time with this girl that wants you to convince you that she's 13, but she's obviously in her 40s. Uh, does not, the movie doesn't work. 
Uh, and that could actually, you could make that culturally significant very well. You, you sit in a, a, you actually have neon have something to do with it and set it in a skid row or in, in, a, in a low income community where there is neon around, you know, bar sign, something like that. Right. Pay attention to your own title, maybe, when it might be part of it. <laughs> I'm sure it was named afterwards, right? <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So the one I've been thinking of, and I can't get it out of my fucking head, is the car. Remaking the car. Okay. Okay, and, yeah. And using that with uh, the things that were happening in Charleston, Carolina, of people just suddenly deciding they're going to run into crowds. Oh. Took their cars and the police yeah. running into cars, uh, into crowds. And I was thinking about how instead of making it this thing where it's like jaws out in the desert with tires, uh, have it be a real time thing. Like it starts with traffic cameras of someone coming into the, they catch the camera, the car driving in from another town. And then it comes in and does the disaster. And then it's real time. It's not a couple days. It's, we're trying to catch this guy. How is he getting the fuck away? What is happening? And just play down that thing. I love the idea of it being an old muscle car, the last vestiges of this patriarchy that will kill people over an idea. And having it be, like in that movie, the, the reason that I thought of it was um, uh, R.G. Armstrong is in that. And he plays a okay. uh, wife beating racist drunk, right? And there's this whole little racism thing that's going on in that movie because there's Native American police officers, right? And so they're constantly being denigrated by the guys that are on the phone and everything. So R.G. Armstrong goes out in the street and the car goes around him to kill the nice guy. And I was right. like, there we go. Proud boys and a guy in a car driving around. And how do we make this into something culturally relevant and have it be where it's just this idea of the anger of this dying patriarchy coming off in four wheels in an old muscle car and have it be like the car where at one point in that movie, they're like, well, was it foreign or was it domestic? I think it was both. I love the idea that no one could really tell what the car was. Yeah. That was really mm -hmm. cool. And they couldn't kill it, you know, but do it in a way where, you know, it's uh, uh, shield or not shield, police officer cameras and traffic like cameras. The, you know, Pelham one, two, three, where the, the, the society yeah. Is hero. Yeah. 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 Go write that. What are you doing talking to us? <laughs> <laughs> but what other ones uh, for, for you folks are you thinking? Uh, or if nothing else, movies that you've seen recently that everybody always says the same ones, but you're watching all these films. Uh, we're, we're watching all these films and some of them are, uh, you know, considered trash that no one would watch or forgotten 1970s films with Jessica Harper. Uh, what ones uh, uh, are you thinking of that uh, would be fun to get people who are listening to watch? Oh, well, you mentioned Phantom of the Paradise. I was going to say, yeah, you mentioned 70s with Jessica Harper. So yeah, yeah. definitely the paradise. That was Swan. Uh, yeah. One of the first tapes Mike ever gave me when we started dating had Bird with a Crystal Plumage, Phantom of the Paradise, and um, Sweeney, Sweeney Todd. Todd's stage version with Angela Lansbury. and oh, wow. uh, um Len Carrier. Len Carrier. Yep. Yeah. I love that one. And those three things. And he was like, like and the, the novelization of The Crow, or the oh. graphic novel, The, graphic Crow. Novel, the Crow. Like, when we first started dating, he was like, here, here. Go. And I just loved all of it. And I was like, okay, this is good. I like this stuff. So... <laughs> Those those three are great. Um, definitely fan of the paradise. Uh, There's uh, if you if you like Sonic the Hedgehog, the guys who wrote that made this hilarious movie called Hey Stop Stabbing Me that you can still <laughs> find, and it's probably coming out again. And it's 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 comedy horror, but it's hysterical, and it was shot for like fourteen bucks. It was uh, it's absolute, and there there are jokes in there that wound up in Sonic the Hedgehog. Oh wow! Which I thought yeah. So it's, uh, that was that's always uh, one that I will recommend. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, shoot. Anguish, anguish, anguish with. Oh uh, wow! With yeah. yeah. Anguish. And oh, in the boneyard uh, with Phyllis Diller and Norman Fell. Oh uh, yeah, that's which which looks like it's supposed to be jokey and cartoony, but really it's it's a it's a pretty straightforward horror film that just happens to have Big Daddy Roth creatures in it. So if if you. <laughs> If you haven't caught those, catch those. Have We're you seen uh, Run, Stranger, Run? And or uh, Hel uh, Happy Mother's Day, Love, George, directed by Darren McGavin? 
Went no, down. I have not, but now I have to. Yeah. Oh, holy yeah. shit. It is such a weird head trip. I found a copy of, or actually John Kitley got me a copy of it because I was telling him how it g- killed me as a kid. It's uh, stars Ron Howard and it's set in okay. New England and he comes to town. Uh, he's uh, a child estranged. He comes back to his hometown and they're all like, somebody's killing somebody. He's, uh, of course, going to be uh, one of the prime suspects and there's this weird fam- familial stuff. But it's the first first movie that I remember, it was like 1972 or something, where it had the Halloween thing of walking in, finding a dead body, backing into another room. There's another dead body running into the room. There's another dead body. It's the first time I ever saw it. And it has this really freaky moment where the killer is obviously strange to say the least it's trying to hide the body like under carpets so it's like a, like a small kid breaks something and he tries to hide what he's broken huh. they do that so the bodies are like positioned in this strange thing like you're really not supposed to see this like hidden in the tub and stuff oh. it really really creeped me out as a kid and it was pretty violent for a pg rated film but uh i won't say it's good but i will say it is worth seeing for that sequence it's a nugget Hmm. Every movie is somebody's favorite. Yeah, so I don't. I don't judge it on that. Something uh, that I was remembered. Arnie uh, is starting to get into. She's eleven now. Yeah, and she's getting into a little bit more adult stuff. She loves horror. She's love. You know, she's doing effects makeup on her face right now and everything. And you know, we're terrible influences. But <laughs> she asks us. You know, or our sister in law, my sister in law, is asking what can we watch. So we're starting to put together stuff that's like. Katie appropriate right now and Lady in White I pulled out. That's, oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah. One, sorry, one That's of the a- movies that I used to watch over and over again uh, when I was younger, and it just it creeped me the hell out, and I loved it, and I loved Catherine Hellman, and when she came yeah. out in the dress and floating up. Oh. So that's yeah, another that's one everybody should check out. Yeah. yeah. It's a beautifully idiosyncratic film. I love it. Yep. It's it's so complex because it's it doesn't know what it wants to be, and yet it no. does all those things right. And uh, yeah. it, and it does such a great Halloween. I mean, uh, the very beginning of that film, the first half hour of that film, feels like Halloween in Hazleton, Pennsylvania, where I grew up. And so it was really. Ah. Oh, all right, all right. We always recommend the original Haunting too. Um, oh to, yeah. To anyone to listen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I mean, except for the old staples, yeah, those are the those are the offbeat ones I can think of. I would put in Theater of Blood as well, since I brought it up. Oh, oh yeah, oh, I, I, I consider that a staple. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah anything, true. That's that's what we were telling Katie today. Is pretty much anything Vincent Price. It's even if it's bad, it's going to be fun. So if, so if you're just scrolling through Netflix, whatever, and you find Vincent Price, just go for it. And if we got me Hank Cry Banshee. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> even uh, Bloodbath at the House of Death. He's even good in that. <laughs> there, there's a movie from I think 1986, 1987. It was shot in Southern Michigan, uh, called The Carrier. One okay. of the uh, just absolutely bizarre film. Uh, if you get a chance to watch it, watch it. Uh, I can't even really explain it. It's it's one of those that would be on Joe Bob Briggs thing of uh, something that's absolutely oh. insane. It's called The Carrier. So there's a million The Carriers, right? But it's, oh, this okay. one's from like 86, 87. And it's about this weird group of people in a village that looks a lot like a small town in Southern Michigan. Uh, And uh, they're in some weird religion and there's an outcast kid and he goes out in the woods and there's something called the black beast that comes after him and scratches him. And from then on, anything that he touches becomes like a cursed item. And so he's walking around touching things. It's perfect for the pandemic. So he's walking around touching things. And if somebody else grabs it, like he reads a book and he puts the book back down, they start to dissolve. It, it starts to like burn them and, and boil them. Mm. Down. And it's really, really weird uh, to say the least. And it's also this thing where it becomes like a religious parable where the two opposing groups start wearing trash bags <laughs> to, to fight each other in a war because they can't touch each other and all this stuff. And people are carrying around cats to throw at objects because they're, uh, the cats will melt instead of them. It's so You're making this up. weird. I'm not no, making it up. It's, it's, it is true. It is real. I don't like it when people bring up movies I've never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> To a great degree. 
I have the same thing. And it's worse when people ask me uh, like something that would be a staple. Well, certainly you've seen, I'm like, no, I yeah. never got around <laughs> to that one. It's like, you haven't seen. It's like, yes, I, ha- I haven't seen. I'm a flawed human being. Get over it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no surprises there for me. But anyway, uh, this has been wonderful. Thank you for giving me so much of your time. I know that you, you've got to get going. Uh, do you have anything fun planned for uh, All Hallows Even? Uh, do you have anything uh, that you're intending to do? We were uh, thinking of quarantining. We were thinking of just staying in all day, yeah, maybe I, having a drink or two, watching some movies, you know, doing something different yeah, than we've been doing for the last... <laughs> nothing, nothing more extravagant. Nothing. No. We, we might like, even you know, text people and say hello. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds marvelous. I went uh, as my usual stupid stuff, and you'll be seeing video of it. I'm probably going to okay. do a live show on, on Halloween, just a Facebook Live for a couple hours to see oh, uh, what happens, because we're going to actually get some trick-or-treaters who will drive by. We'll have a table okay. with little bags. But I did my I'm normal, sorry. ridiculous, way over-the-top decorating of the house, so uh, I'll probably want to at least sit in it since... Uh, Everything else is kind of stopped. I'm not allowing Halloween uh, to not have its dance of death this year. But uh, (laughs) uh, Mike and Amy, it's been a pleasure getting to speak with you again. And uh, thanks for coming on. And I'd love to have you on again at another point. And thanks for listening to the show. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. You can find more on our website, hellbentforhorror.com, and I'm also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash hellbentforhorror, and my Twitter handle is hellbenthorror. Please hit that subscribe button to get H4H hot off the press, and if you can do a review on iTunes or whatever app you listen to us on, that really helps people get to find us. And now for some Hellbent for Horror news. The podcast is available on some more outlets now, so you can listen to H4H on Spotify, iHeartRadio, and TuneIn Radio, as well as the regular iTunes, Android, and Amazon apps. And let there be swag. H4H t-shirts are now on sale. We have a store on tpublic.com with a bunch of Hellbent for Horror designs, and you can have your choice of t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, coffee mugs, something horrible beautiful for you or that's someone special. The link to the merchandise store is on our website, hellbentforhorror.com. And until we meet again, stay hellbent.